Hello, welcome. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, I am not Pippa Oldfield. Um, I'm sorry she sends her regrets. I am Sarah Parsons. I'm an associate professor of art history at York University in Toronto and a part of the group and larger collaboration that um, has been working on Cold War camera for some time. So I am filling in uh, last minute for, for Pippa um, as moderator. So um, at the idea for this roundtable as a kickoff to our longer conversation about Cold War camera over the next two days is um, uh, to have uh, three presentations and, um, and then time for questions. And I will ask a few questions to kind of guide us along, but we hope to, to leave time at the end and we'll finish up at about 6.30. Is that right timing? with the reception. <laughs> We'd want to cut off time, reception time. Um, OK, so the first two speakers are Erina Dugan and um, T. Fu, co-editors, along with Andrea Noble of the Cold War Camera. Erina is a professor of art history at Texas State University, uh, where she researches and um, teaches uh, post-war American photography. I'm keeping our bios rather brief so that we can move on to things those Full bios are available in, on the website and, um, and in the handout for this uh, conference. Um, and Tifu is a distinguished professor of race, diaspora, and visual justice at the University of Toronto. And she has written um, several books on uh, Asian photography and Asian American photography. Um, and then our two other speakers today will be um, Susan Mysalis, a documentary photographer who probably needs no introduction, based in New York, um, and the author of Carnival Strippers, 1976, Nicaragua, 1981, uh, and Kurdistan, The Shadow of History, 1997, and, and uh, revisited in 2008, among other books. She's known for her documentation of human rights issues over a decade in Latin America. Um, she was a MacArthur Fellow and has been president of Magnum Foundation since 2007. Um, and our other, our fourth speaker today um, is Tong Lam, who is a associate professor of history at the University of Toronto, uh, with research projects on infrastructure, empire, and nation, and the politics of information. Um, he uses lens-based work to reveal evidence of state and capital precipitated violence both fast and slow in his visual projects. Uh, his most recent project focuses on the material evidence of Cold War, Cold War mobilizations globally and their environmental and social consequences. Um, before we move to our, our discussion and our presentations, I want to thank our funders for this event, which include uh, Shirk, uh, NIOD, um, the organizers for the event, volunteers, and student assistants. We are incredibly appreciative of everybody's contributions to this collaboration. OK, so to get us started, uh, T and Erina, what for you is the concept of the Cold War camera? Can you give the clicker? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks so much for the introductions. Can you, can you hear me? OK. Thanks so much for the introductions, um, Sarah, and for um, that question. It's a big question. And in some ways, you can kind of think, well, don't we already know the answer to this? We, we kind of know what the Cold War is, and we know what photography is. We've seen images of the Cold War. They, they're present even if we don't see them. They're, they precede kind of our um, kind of viewing engagement because they have the force of um, iconic power. Um, but, you know, sometimes I, when I began this project, I was wondering what got hidden um, behind the icon. When we see spectacular images, say from Vietnam, um, of the of uh, nuclear dis the mushroom cloud of nuclear destruction, and more, I kept wondering um, what other parts of the global Cold War, um, despite the hyper visibility of this ongoing conflict, um, remained invisible. 
the hypervisibility and kind of the, the notion of um, uh, unvisibility. And so the, the project really is part of kind of the, the broader work that is examining or re-examining um, Cold War uh, cultural studies, but turns to, looks really closely at photography's prosecution of the war and the processes of rendering visible and invisible um, different sites, particularly of proxy conflict um, that others had not attended to. So the, the dominant narratives of the Cold War, for example, which was uh, you know, the binary between um, the US and the USSR that again played out in the global south, we wanted to turn the lens not to ignore that, that um, uh, east-west uh, conflict, but to turn the lens to um, other sites um, that had received uh, much shorter shrift. So that was like the larger, one of the larger uh, research questions that we were asking here. So um, we wanted to consider how we do not see the war, how both how we see the war and how we do not see the war, um, as well as the, the global dimensions of this war. And we also proceeded with the conviction that the seemingly familiar narrative was actually um, incomplete, that instead of um, ending in 1991, 80, 1989 and 1991, um, that you know, as those of us who were shaped um, by the war, um, uh, whose uh, nations are still divided in two, I'm thinking of Korea, North and South Korea, um, they're still living not with the aftermath, but with the reality of the, of the global Cold War. Um, and so those were some of the questions that initially animated us in this project. Do you want to talk to you a little bit about um, the ways in which your work has um, developed from this project or in, you know, informed this project, um, intersected with this project perhaps? Um, yeah, actually, um, thanks for the reminder. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> we've been, I shall, I shall speak a little bit more about kind of the, the communities out of which our research emerged. Um, but, you know, some of us, we're part of a huma very humanities-based training. We just focus on our own work. We hide out in archives. Um, we kind of close the door and then eventually let the air in, maybe. And we maybe talk to other people. And so I had my own project that culminated in this book on the, um, the war in Vietnam and photography from the perspective of Vietnamese photographers. And I was really interested in where the cameras came from, where they went, where they, the sites of visual exchange. I really really wanted to know who trained these photographers, the East Germans, um, where they got their cameras from the Soviet Union, through, through China, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and then where they went, you know, through exhibit, exhibits in um, uh, the communist bloc. Um, I followed the trail and then it went cold because no single person can do this kind of work. Right. Um, uh, the, some of the archives were, were closed to me, and um, while I wasn't able to answer these particular questions in my book, I realized that there was a project that needed to be done, and it was a project that needed to be done with a large group of scholars who are working completely outside my area of expertise. So this is where um, the connections that I had in particular with a, a, a really wonderful scholar, Andrea Noble, who we'll speak a lot more about um, today, who's just a co-editor of this book and um, died um, a very untimely early death. Um, she's a Latin American scholar, works completely outside of what I was doing, but we found common ground around these particular kinds of questions of archives and the hypervisible and the invisible. Thanks. Yes. Um, Andrea has also been um, very important to me. Um, so this is a project that T and Andrea began, and I like to think that I am really, you know, I'm fortunate that I'm like been brought into it <laughs> um, at a later stage, but I, I really want, you know, to emphasize that this is T and Andrea's project, and um, they helped me to see certain things that I hadn't realized I was working on. Um, especially in relationship to Susan's work. I had always been interested in Susan's work. Um, I had shown it in this exhibition called Beautiful Suffering. Um, 
And it wasn't until I went to this kind of first initial conference, um, I'm just going to go up here for one second, called Doing Photography that was held in Durham that Andrea Noble um, organized. That I, And when I presented on Susan's work from Nicaragua, that Andrea turned to me and she's like, you're working on the Cold War. And I was like, I am? <laughs> I hadn't, you know, like, it just wasn't the framework. It wasn't the analytic. And that was this really important moment. Um, and I feel so fortunate that they kind of brought me into this project um, and allowed me to start to look at, I'm going to go back now, um, the 1980s from a completely different lens. And it wasn't, and you know, it was because of this focus on the Cold War that I started to realize that you could look at photography in the 1980s um, from a different lens, from a different analytic, one that um, moved beyond kind of this emphasis on suspicion um, and could actually begin to think about networks of solidarity. And that, that was a huge moment for me, um, realizing this in part through Susan's work. It also allowed me to look at, say, this image that you're looking at by Cohn Wessing that's published in Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida, right? Published in the US in 1981. No one ever thinks about this book or this image in relationship to the Cold War. Um, what is the Dutch photographer, right, doing in Nicaragua? Um, and then, you know, publishing this image in his book. Um, how does that, in fact, be, you know, begin to show solidarity, begin to offer a framework for thinking about solidarity and ways of standing in solidarity um, with the revolution in Nicaragua, and then, of course, um, in, in relation to the Contra War that quickly um, superseded that revolution. Uh, so this, um, this framework of the Cold War uh, really changed things for me, and that led me down a path uh, where then, through Susan's work again, um, I became interested in an activist campaign that took place in New York in 1984 called Artists Call Against U.S. Intervention in Central America. Susan was involved with this campaign. Um, people like Lucy Lepard were a part of it, group material. Um, Danielle Flores, who's Salvadoran. It was all of these artists who came together, again, in support against U.S. intervention in Central America. Um, and this is part, right, um, Reagan's basically, you know, they were also in against uh, the framework through which Reagan was discussing Central America um, that was perpetuated through photography um, in terms of needing to contain, right, um, communism. And um, this, again, opened up this way of seeing uh, this time period that has then led to an exhibition that I recently curated about Artist Call and to a book project that I'm working on. So it really um, changed, for me, a lot of things. And I think that it's beginning to open up. I think solidarity is a framework that many people are now actually thinking about um, more in visual terms. Uh, so again, it's thanks to Andrea and T, um, who who really you know started this work, and allowed other others of us to kind of come along. Um, as I said, it began um, in Durham, and it was T and Andrea working together after Durham. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, the first event was a, a workshop in Guatemala, Guatemala City, at a time when they were um, trying to work through the kind of processes for transitional justice. And in that um, workshop, we visited um, the uh, police archives that held a number of surveillance um, images as documentation of uh, war 
or atrocities. We visited um, forensic sites where we were identifying um, uh, victims of these atrocities, and it became kind of the, the groundwork to just really why we when we gather funding in order to bring together scholars, much of the funding bodies are very nationally um, oriented. And when, you, when we get funding from Canada, they want to know, why are you not doing these um, uh, conferences or these workshops in Canada? And we said, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to go to the site um, to kind of connect with um, uh, the, the activists, the um, community organizers who were in, Gu in Guatemala who were trying to advocate on behalf of, of, of um, these calls for justice. And so um, that became really important to um, kind of decenter the United States to go to, to Guatemala as kind of where, where kind of the, um, intervention um, uh, in, in Latin America actually began. Um, and the next um, event happened the year after in Guatemala City, um, sorry, Mexico City. Yeah, Mexico City. Yeah. And I never remember how to pronounce this place. <laughs> it's a lot of local. Uh, Tata Loco. Tata Loco. So Mexico is not a place where you think about um, the Cold War being a significant um, place, but the, the massacre in 1968, the student suppressions, that was a particular year when um, there was a quite a lot of controversy arising over um, the kidnapping and um, murder of students um, that was invoked in the name of a, a Red Scare. And Andrea's work reminded us of kind of the palimpsestic kind of projection um, uh, a dehistoricizing um, analogies that were taking place um, in the midst of uh, the narco wars that were, were happening. And she was really interested in looking at kind of the intersections between these two moments um, that remind us of how kind of these violent pasts had not yet been fully um, resolved. Um, so when we um, organized these events, we were trying to gather together scholars who were working in, diff in these areas, or scholars who didn't think that they were working in these areas, um, but we were just opening up an invitation to get to encourage them to re-examine their work, to really consider how it connected um, and how it intersected um, with the work of scholars who were in, in other uh, regions. It was an experiment with, or we um, took seriously a transnational turn in scholarship, and, try, and we're trying very much to do that kind of work. Um, so our hope was always to broaden the critical framework to really experiment with what transnational scholarship could do, and to try to um, grapple with kind of the uneven structures of scholarship that's oriented within the global north, if you want, if you want to put it this way, with our access to resources um, in uh, well recognizing that this is what was happening. We were trying our very best to be able to open it up um, to an invitation that would be um, kind of as, as inclusive as possible. And in part, this is kind of what um, this event here in um, the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, was um, meant to do as well, because our, our partnership with NEOD, who is a co-sponsor for this event, um, NEOD, an institution that is about the documentation of war, seemed to be a, a perfect a perfect partner for this, and I'll speak a little bit more tomorrow at our symposium about um, the significance of this partnership in terms of this latest phase of the project. And before we turn to Susan and Tong, we just wanted to take a moment um, and um, remember and celebrate um, our friend, our colleague, um, kind of our inspiration, Andrea Noble, who um, as TRD mentioned, um, died unexpectedly um, in the middle of this project. And this book, which is, as you see, you know, doing photography began in 2015. It's, no, 2013. It's been 10 years. Um, and, it, and it took a lot of dedication um, to see this project to the end. And I really um, thank you all for being here um, in her honor as well. So thank you so much for that explication of the project and its development and those beautiful words about Andrea. So I'll turn to Susan and 
I'm hoping you can tell us a bit about your work during the Cold War and legacies of this work. I think you're going to focus particularly on Nicaragua, which Erin already mentioned. So, <laughs> oh, I know it's so as up. we say in Latin America, Andrea Noble Presente. We can all say that. Andrea Noble Presente. You know, it's, it's very moving. I, um, I never met Andrea. I don't know how that was, but that tells you something. I think it's wonderful we're meeting today. So I just want to, I mean, in a way, I... Um, oh, yeah. Let me get... You want to... I put, can get your slideshow you up, can do that. Susan. I, um, oh, you got it. But I want to say that um, I feel honored... Oh. Uh, to think backward with you and to think that, you know, across generations. I think what's, um, it's also a pleasure for me that a number of my former students are here from Leiden, from the Curatorial Studies Program, which means you're going forward in all kinds of ways that I don't even know about yet, but I hope to hear more about. That That's also very moving for me. It kind of ties me back to my time in Holland, which was very special. So, um, how do you begin to look back? Can you go close to me? I know. We're, we're Mac people, and this is PC world. Uh, so, when Erin and I spoke, I was trying to think, I, I was seeing these recent headlines, and it's such a time warp for me, and it's an important one to try and reflect on. So I can't compress 45 year history in relationship with Nicaragua but, and Nicaraguan history. Um, but I think I can look back at, at in some ways and share how the images I made in the past now may be seen in the present. And so I I'm, I'm really want to share some questions about both what I saw or understood as I was seeing and what do you know? You know how do you know what you know? How do you learn? So. And being a practitioner in the field, I'm just going to, let's see, I have to do this. So um, first, I had no idea that there had been a five decade history of US support for the Somoza family dictatorship. We didn't learn that in American schools. My first encounter with Nicaragua was in June 78. And nor did I at that time foresee the popular insurrection, and frankly, nobody else did who was specialized, maybe Andrea did, but no Latin American scholars I was reading predicted a triumph. No, Angela. Um, as an American, I began, whoop, what happened? As an American, I was beginning to track US presence. So whether it was in the advertising, or more importantly, recording US involvement, where it could be visible. Right, So this is a blindfolded training of uh, uh, Somoza's elite troops disarming M16s. I'm sorry, it's really hard. I can't see what I'm even showing you So if I look like that. Um, but, but I think it's an, it's an important, this is the US Marines as advisors, not on the ground, right? Ah, that would have been better. Well. <laughs> Okay, we're ad living. That's great. Thank you. Let's see. Will it stick there? Okay, that's far better. Sort of. Eh, anyway, we'll figure it out. So, I was really seeing at the same time a deeper counter history. So, going back to General Augusto Sandino, who had fought successfully, mobilized the Nicaraguans in the 20s to fight the US Marines. Whoops, how do we get there? Sorry. Noted in the Times, but on the walls when I arrived. Sandino was not only present on the walls. Sandino was also an inspiration to move the youth, move and mobilize the muchachos who called themselves Sandinistas before they got onto the streets. Other images were, whoops, sorry. Alongside me were other foreigners, Kuhn, 
amongst many others, and Nicaraguan photographers. So for me, it was working with other, other photographers, and many of whom were working for the opposition newspaper La Prensa. So I was sharing my images in Nicaragua as I was seeing them, and sometimes coming from being published in the foreign press, coming back to Nicaragua. So as, I, as I'm moving through as an outsider, I'm learning to read the signs, you know, decode the walls, literally read them in the sense that this on the left, it says, Donde esta Norma Gonzalez, the dictatorship must answer. So this is referring to a history of disappeared that many of you would know in Argentina and Chile and the, just in the years beforehand. And then you, you're reading a different sign when you're looking on the right. You're reading a sign of the painting of the past at the time of the triumph of the Sandinistas. So this defiant gesture, just one of many images I made pretty accidentally. I just happened to be at the place where the front line in which this was the last day before Samosa fled the country. So it became a symbolic gesture. And simultaneously, the next day, all the, all the Sandinistas from wherever they were in the country mobilized into the central plaza. So how do you see what a revolution is or what it will become? I mean, that was, I mean, they called it a revolution. It's interesting the difference between an insurrection, a mobilizing of people towards an idea, and what a revolution then does. So I was looking for what does it do? What is it the first doing, the daily doing? Building sidewalks, a literacy class, alphabetization campaign, etc. I'm also beginning to watch what happens with the circulation of images, mostly in the international press, alongside the ones that I pointed to that were um, uh, locally. This is a wall on the, on the right side, which is not in the town where the Molotov man was fighting, but he was painted on the walls. And I begin to track this idea of how photographs have a life of their own. So other images were reappropriated, partly reappropriated because I repatriated them. The New York Times image became a tourist poster for Monimbo, the, the welcoming the tours of the revolution of those who had only read about it from afar. The visitors to the barrio where the original picture was made, that was their, their idea. But you also, within a very short time, and this speaks to where we're going, Within four years, the media tone shifted. And the shift was the headline on the Newsweek cover, which I always noted, a revolution betrayed with no question mark. You know, an affirmation, an assertion. Um, so what's going on on the background that you're not seeing when you're in Nicaragua, but if you cross the border you see in El Salvador, is a mobilizing of another insurrection, both in El Salvador and farther, as you noted, in Guatemala. And on the right side, you see a photograph from 1981 of the Adelkop Battalion training to fight against the insurgency, of course, trained at the School of Americas. So following the photographs, right, this is the consequences. In 1983, the US was involved in covert operations. Many of you probably do know that, supporting a counter-revolution known as the Contras. And the Molotov man was sent to me in an, envelope, in an envelope. It was being used to raise the funds for the Contras, who were being trained to cross the border from Honduras and Costa Rica. The photograph on the right I made at a Contra camp in Honduras. So crossing borders is an important idea to think about. And you're talking transnational borders, who's crossing what borders, the privilege of being able to cross borders, which is something I'm sure we'll talk more about tomorrow. But I want to keep going with what it means to trace the dispersed path, in this case of the Molotov Man, parallel in, parallel in time with the Newsweek cover, 1983. He celebrated as a monument in his own hometown. And he's, I mean, the, the, he's stenciled on the walls throughout Nicaragua to mobilize a popular militia to face the threat of an anticipated invasion by either, actually at the time, the Contras or the US Marines. So the challenge is to keep track, right? The Molotov man appeared again. Now, now we're on, at the 40th anniversary of the revolution, of the popular insurrection that overthrew Samosa. 
and this is coming to me via Facebook. So I'm jumping in time. The student rebellion at that time chose to place him on their t-shirts. And it said, que se rinda tu madre, which I don't know, Angelis, it's, it's very Nicaraguense. It's like, I, I think I shouldn't repeat it, but it's, you get the idea, right? Do it to your mother, right? Would you do it to your mother? Um, so the challenge, um, I guess what I'm trying to, I'm tracking and sharing is these symbols that keep coming back as a kind of ghost of a past and a mobilization and an attempt to mobilize, mobilize. So Sandino in this case survives alongside the protagonists of the resistance in 2018, just before the barricades were completely demolished and the movement crushed. So since 2018, for those of you read, reading, I get Google alerts about Nicaragua almost every day. We keep reading about hundreds of deaths and arrests, and after nearly two years in prison, 222 from people from the opposition who had been in prison for two years um, fighting against the Ortega regime were forced into exile, and their citizenship was stripped, Nicaraguan citizenship. Ironically, the US welcomed them. So again, you know. Um, I'm sorry, that, the picture on the right I took during the, that period of the resistance. So what else can the might, might have happened is in my mind still, you know, the Nicaraguan aspirations. What if there had been no Cold War? What might have happened in Nicaragua? Um, I'm still somewhat haunted by that possibility. I'm making images in the present, thinking about how in the future they're going to be seen as the past. So there's one different step in what I told you originally. And I think that's the picture on the left is coming from a project called Reframing History, where I brought the photographs back to see what it meant, what the memory of them meant um, on the 25th anniversary. Right, 25 years later is a very important year because half the population is under 25 and certainly hadn't lived the revolution. And the picture on the right I made at the same time. The Sandinistas at that time took the images and placed them where they chose. The one on the left is marking where I made the original image. So what I think a lot about is that these images have traveled far beyond anything I could have controlled or imagined. And when I think about the revolution, many once fought for and dreamed of, I keep thinking about what could I not see? What was invisible to my, my, my mind's eye? You know, I can't go back to remember as I was moving. I only have them as my reference, in a sense. And at the end of the 80s, I installed a, a, a show called Crossings. I hope it's going to play. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Ah, you see, I told you, peas, Mac and HP don't play well together. You're not, yeah, but it's not going to play. It's no, it says the media is not found. It's not happy. It's not going to find it. That's too bad. Um, it did play it, but I don't know where it is. I don't know if we can find it. Um, there's one more image on there though I do want to show. I don't Where do you see it? No, that's a different. The last icon the right. The last icon the right. You mean here? Yeah. Oh. Anilis. It's Tong's. Oh. That's Tong's movie. Don't. No, that's his movie, not mine. Okay. You know what? I'll describe it. I'll describe it. I don't want to lose too much time. Let's go back to just, I'll, I'll just end on this, and that's okay. How do we get to the home, the main screen? Is it this? Yeah? No. Yeah. Whoa. Hmm. I'll just go through quickly. We're not perfectly matched in time. Anyway, if you can get to the last slide. I'm just going to end on a slide. I wanted you to see this show because I, I think it's a really important, before I tell you about this, I made a series of panoramics on the US-American border. 
and in between the panoramics of people leaving Mexico and trying to cross into the U.S., you see photographs that are of El Salvador and from Nicaragua from the past 10 years before. So this was 1990, trying to make sense of the feared feet people, Kissinger's reference to the invasion. And to me, that's still the locus of the Cold War. The failed states the devastation of those countries, and so whether or not they're seeking economic or political exile, that's really, to me, what where the Cold War still lives. Um, it's just, I was ending on this because I just want to read you what I, what I wrote in 1990. For those who are crossing, an arrest is a stopping. Paths are temporarily reversed, and people are often sent back to the countries and conditions they fled. For those who remain, we rarely ask who they are or why this is the choice they have made. So we pass the silent faces on the street, in the stores, even in our own homes. We see their eyes, but we don't know what their eyes have seen or how they see us. So I'm very much immersed in this thinking about how histories move on, the meanings of photographs aren't fixed, aren't finished, they're very fluid. And I continue to see this legacy of the long war, the Cold War, the US border today. So the migration crisis, as you probably read about, is fueled by the proxy wars 50 years ago. Um, I added this just because the picture on the left is President Ortega at the time celebrating Sandino's 50th anniversary of birth. And this, the hill I picked up off the internet two days or three days ago, that's what Washington's thinking about. So we've come full circle in a sense, but just what might that mean? That was what was fueling the fear of the communists, the feel of the insurgency, the feel of an alternative society that might be built in Central America. Um, and here we are. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's so fascinating um, to hear your account and, and rethinking of it. Um, so now we'll move on to Tong, whose work you have already seen a little snippet of, either on the front cover of the Cold War camera book or the slide that had that in um, T and Arena's uh, presentation. But um, I'd love for Tong to come up and talk a bit more about his photographs of post-socialist ruins and uh, future projects. So, um, yeah, yeah. So you have a PowerPoint as well as yes, that. Yeah. Okay. So the problem is this is not. Go to here. The problem is it doesn't sit here. So you have oh. to see it, or do you need to see it? Uh, I need the, the video eventually, so I need to okay. have it here. But I, yeah. Do you want me to keep holding it? In the meantime, I don't need it. Okay. Uh, just the video. Okay. Then I can. I have to hold it myself. Yeah. This one will already is not fair. Um, but uh, how do I get the first one? Okay, thank you um, to have me here, and, and it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, so, uh, so I was asked to, to, to reflect on my um, understanding of the Cold War, and for me, uh, sort of following up from uh, um, um, Susan just earlier, uh, the Cold War for me also is not something that happened simply in the past, but we are very much in the present, uh, we are very much living in the legacy in the some way that the Cold War continues its process of ruinations and devastation, in some way even exacerbating some of these destructions. Um, so I'm kind of interested in create images that sort of capture the continuations of destructions. Um, so we kind of, in a way for me, that we you know, look around many of the issues that we are encountering today, what are we are uh, thinking about problems in liberal democracies as well as in the so-called uh, the post-communist, post-socialist state. In many ways, uh, those problems that are emerging is perhaps only the beginning of 
those legacy that we're seeing. I don't want to scare people. So in other words, the Cold War definitely not about the, the end of history. You know, so I really want to sort of start out with emphasizing the beginning of a process of ruination. So part of my work is to try to capture and document and to try to use images to provoke uh, our thinkings about those issues. So I want to talk about those full two projects that I've been working on. Um, first project is called uh, Where There's No Room for Fictions. Uh, this project has competed uh, a couple of years ago. And this is a project sort of um, it's about a documentation, about a five to six year documentations of a uh, uh, um, urban demolitions in China, one of the uh, uh, Chinese metropolis in, 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 in uh, it's called Guangzhou or Canton. Um, so the story is very complicated, so I'm trying to condense it. I'm going to move very quickly because you know, I'll be happy to, to check about it uh, uh, in Q&A or maybe over Y and, and <laughs> beer later. So, but in any case, that, that, uh, as we know, the China have gone through a very rapid uh, 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 urbanization in the past four decades or so. So uh, during the communist or the socialist era, uh, meaning 50, 60, uh, many of the farmland were collectivized. Um, so this is one of the places where you become a commune, okay? So where the villagers are supposedly collectively own those lands. Uh, over the decades after the so-called post-socialist era since 19, late 1970s, uh, with the rapid urbanizations, with huge migrant, number of migrant workers moving from the countryside to the cities, you know, that, that's why we, we have all these junks that you can buy in the Walmart and, you know, et cetera. They were all created by uh, uh, um, the factory in, in the cities, in the surrounding area. So with those people moving in it, a lot of the farmlands surrounding the city, in this case Guangzhou, but by no means the only case, but in fact the dozens of the city having the same experience, many of this farmland that usually uh, it used to be collectively owned and is now uh, uh, become part of the city, swallowed by the urbanization process. Because those land was still collectively owned, it, um, it, they, the value has gone up. However, it's very difficult for the government and the developer to come in and simply demolish them because they own collectively. In other words, even though I'm willing to give this particular spot that I'm on to the developer with you know, a compensation, uh, everyone else in the neighborhoods have claimed a share of that particular land. So it's very difficult. So you have to negotiate with all of them, right? So you create a kind of possibility of resistance. Resistance not so much about the demolition itself, resistance to demand for higher compensation. So we're talking a moment that in the post-socialist era where the logic of capital has completely taken over, right? This is not, these people are not fighting for the nostalgic, not, not nostalgic about the socialist past. They just want a more money. And a lot of time in the case of China, we're talking about a state-led neoliberal uh, 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 policy, meaning that uh, um, you know, neoliberal capitalism is not necessarily simply uh, advanced by the entrepreneurs, but a lot of time it's actually by enterprise and, and including state enterprise. In this case, it's actually the people's liberation armies, uh, uh, a developer that are uh, uh, be, you know, sorry, the people's liberation army was behind this developer. In other words, it is a you know, military uh, uh, supported developer who tried to demolish this neighborhood with the people resisting it. So what happened is that the people, this is sort of, sort of um, uh, about 10 years ago, the people, uh, again, fought back meaning that they want to have more money, they refused it. So one day uh, um, in early uh, t uh, 2010s, uh, um, the government sent in um, thousands of police surrounding the neighborhood. And then with that, uh, quickly they sent in hundreds of gangsters uh, to beat up the people. And then after that, then they will send uh, heavy equipment to try to demolish it. Um, the people, again, fought back to resist, and then the whole process is frozen. Um, so then this been becomes like that for the next decades as the developer and the government have to negotiate with many of the people who are holding out bit by bit. So during the process, I try to document that kind of confrontation. In the story, it's not black and white. It's not an like evil government versus the, the, the good people. Rather, as I said, the people who are holding up are the people who actually want to extract Sometimes I would think even unreasonable amount of money. So people who live in the neighborhood are the people who are actually renting rooms from the owners. Okay, so this actually 
far more common. It's not good and bad or you know, uh, good and evil, but rather what I call a shade of grace, right? So it's in between. And people who live there actually have nothing to lose or gain in the process. Um, so I try to document what by, because it's you're not supposed to be there, uh, obviously, because all this places uh, 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 are brought off by security. So you can see uh, at night, just to, to indicate that you know, the, uh, there are people who are living, even electricity and water have been cut off, but there are people who are still living in buildings that were partially demolished because they kind of managed to hold on and then you know, they, they stopped the demolition because it's, it was an illegal demolition, a right? forced uh, eviction, uh, as a violent eviction that was illegal. Um, so what I'm trying to do, um, um, not simply documenting it, I see the images here, I can move very quickly. Um, this is the migrant workers, right? the people who are renting room from those places. You can see at night, this pack of it is already demolished. They start building, so the construction is going on 24-7 in, in some pack of the neighborhood. Um, so what I do is that during the day, I will go around and collect normally just cell phone or some other thing, uh, images or videos, and I would select still images from those video, and at night I will go back to this place and project the images onto the wall. Um, so to play with story of, uh, uh, the issues about figure and ground to sort of in design theory, but also thinking about, you know, sort of make us think about, you know, what is the priority, what is the foreground and background in the works. Um, but it's also like bringing, for those who are into photography, uh, you might spend time in the dark room. Um, um, it is like, burning and dodging, so it's essentially bringing the dark room into the open space as a, a on-site, site-specific installation. Uh, so my dialogue with, um, 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 uh, with this space uh, in the middle of the ruin. So I'm just quickly show uh, a few images. I'll move from the next project. So, but the, 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 the point here is, uh, this is almost like oil painting, but it's kind of essentially just two layers of images here. But uh, one is a project onto the, the the place and I have a close up images of the wounds itself. So what you see essentially in a way that I want to sort of think about, you know, the sort of state and capital driven uh, violence, right, in, in the places where where uh, we don't normally think about this as a Cold War, but it's in fact, it's a, it's a process, as a, as a consequence of the Cold War, um, um, what we see China as a you know, a certain version of authoritarianism of the uh, state today is very really much part of that one other uh, outcome of the Cold War, right, as opposed to situations that we see in Eastern Europe and elsewhere. So, uh, I end here because, uh, for this first PACS project because there's so many things to cover. Um, so, again, I'm happy to answer your question and check about later on. So, the second project is more sort of slightly more predictable kind of images of the Cold War. Uh, I call them Cold Facts. This is an ongoing project. Um, I'm kind of, in addition, in the post socialist transition, both in China and elsewhere, I'm also interested in. Um, um, so, in the earlier project, I have written several articles about it, uh, where it's no room for fiction. So, this current project is I'm uh, um, sort of interested in stories of secret cities, so-called secret cities, cities that were closed off um, to the public during the Cold War mobilization. And this is a city that were used to, for Cold War mobilization, um, normally they are associated with the industrial military compacts in different parts of the world, okay? Particular superpower, of course. Um, so these are sort of images from the secret cities. Um, they could be military bases, they could be coal mining towns that were hidden in the mountains in southwestern part of China, um, built next to uh, uh, um, mountain with valleys. So that the, the idea was that, well, in case the American, the Soviet bombers, they, they attack them, they will not be able to bomb them. So these cities are, are known by uh, uh, numbers. They have no names. They, won't, they did not exist on the maps. And so in this case on the right, uh, there was a dormitory building uh, from the era that was uh, uh, lived by the coal miners. A lot of these people continue to live there in the consequence of that, but some been abandoned by the state. So when we look at the, the shiny, beautiful mega cities along the Chinese coast, we don't think about the hinterland, right? This is the consequence, the other part of the, the flip side of the story. Um, another example, very quickly, that we see the, uh, um, I think it speaks for itself, the Nevada Welfare Simulation Song in, in the US. Um, this is a kind of place that's act, very active. Once upon a time, I think first uh, after Pearl Harbor, they sort of, they simulate uh, um, with Japanese landscapes and equipments. 
so this essentially the the uh, enemy's territory is now moving to the home, right? So so uh, they constructed the enemy territory, and then over the year it became Vietnam, and then. Uh, uh, in the past few decades, mostly be be become a uh, uh, Gulf War uh, types of landscape, and so the uh, when I encountered this one, uh, uh, I was a bit shocked that it almost looks like uh, it reminded me at the time when I first, you know, by chance drove into this building. I mean, I'm referring to the bu building at, at the bottom, on the bottom. That I, I thought the first reaction was uh, that was like um, uh, similar to the house that Osama bin Laden. Uh, uh, state and and the, so there are villages that are uh, uh, of course fake villages that you can see look uh, um, present themselves as market towns, uh, um, gas station with different kind of material and you can see bullet holes and but the, what it really was mostly for for uh, uh, fighter jets and bomber above to to look at them and and attack them, right? Simulations and there were quite a number of those. Um, one of the simulation things we don't call simulation, of course, is simulation of a nuclear test site. And this is the ground zero of the Soviet Union nuclear test site in uh, today's Kazakhstan. Uh, and same thing happened in Nevada and, or Xinjiang, China, right? so, or, or Australia, uh, used by the, uh, the UK and elsewhere. Um, so I kind of interested in Cold War, as T mentioned earlier, that I'm not thinking about Cold War as East-West construct or binary, but thinking about Cold War as global Cold War. I'm interested in the parallel and connected process. Um, but what were the connections? Not so much of a necessary ideology. Despite the ideological and geopolitical differences, I kind of look at um, the connections uh, in terms of technological developments, in terms of mobilization, the speed of mobilization, uh, the materialities, the everyday life, as well as consumptions and, and, and extraction, uh, etc. So here is uh, all nuclear related um, with uh, Ukraine on the left, and uh, one of the coal mines uh, in China called, again, uh, with a number 713, and then uh, the test site that I mentioned in Kazakhstan. Uh, of course, that this place, all these places are radioactive, um, but I have no way of capturing the, 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 the you know, radioactive, yeah, so you have to wear those things, uh, not in everywhere, but in, in Kazakhstan, you saw the, the image earlier that I have to wear the, the, the hazmat myself. And, but so that I'm sort of decided in this case, I use a infrared camera that, that can rendering things into different, different colors, and I found there is one, uh, that captures a certain frequency that actually turned it into pink. And pink is, I feel, is the color of capitalism, of consumption. But it's also the color of empire. If you look at the 19th century maps, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but, 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 but it's interesting that but, you know, um, we kind of think about it's a sort of soft, I better say, the, the pink is also the color of empire in the 19th century. If you look at the uh, European maps, uh, the metropoles are all in pink colors. And so a lot of the colonial building in the Mediterranean as well as in, in the uh, uh, um, uh, Caribbean are painted in the colors, particularly the House of Governors and, and, and government offices, etc. So I decided the pink might be the proper color to, to think about. But, I, but in general, I'm kind of interested in the parallel process. Right? It's not one or the other, but it's rather to think about this as a global processes, despite all the differences and confrontation that we human beings are actually doing exactly the same thing, you know, to kill each other. Not a surprise, right? Um, again, I, I, I want to move quickly. So, so the same kind of idea that about uh, on the left, it's another uranium mine in China. These people didn't even have water. Um, or electricity they live in. So this is sort of the left behind. So once upon a time, they were um, part of the mobilization. They were on the top of the, high, the, the, the pinnacle where, you know, considered as a worker under the socialist and communist states. But, but after that is now that, you know, they, they were uh, essentially uh, abandoned and forgotten. So I'm kind of interested in the stories that uh, if you think about war images, a type of images that are about violence, but fast violence, media events, but then also I'm kind of interested in slow violence, violence that you know, unfold slowly, but persistently, that it's not captured by media because no one seems to pay attention, no one looks the other way, but rather this in fact is ongoing. That's what I mean is you know, that we are very much live in 
um, I wouldn't even say legacy, we are in fact living in the middle of it, right? Maybe it was the beginning of that uh, devastation. So, you know, so images was just sort of, again, the parallel. Um, I don't know why I'm interested in <laughs> Samuel Cemetery, but, but this is like the one, uh, this is the people who die in uh, mining the uranium mine uh, in, in this place uh, I captured that earlier. And, and then this is the, again, uh, uh, Kuchatov in Semipolansky is, it was a coast city. So the, the, the cemetery inside were the people who died um, in the coast city who were uh, 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 developing nuclear bombs. So they, this is the, it was equivalent to Nosanimo in the US, right? So I'm sort of interested in thinking about images through that death to think about the kind of sacrifice in so-called, in this so-called national sacrifice zones. Um, Come back at the end, as I think about, you know, I'm interested in China is one of the objects of my study, one of the sites of my study. But, but China, of course, is not just about uh, China. China China is everywhere. Uh, we can see this image was taken actually a few weeks ago in Albania. And during the Cold War, China has heavily invested in uh, Albania as a part of the Cold War uh, mobilization, both against the US, but against the Soviet Union as well, and that's why they were Albania. So this is the oil field they left behind. It happened to be uh, now becoming, you know, they exist in the middle of a cemeteries. And, and images uh, in a actually oil field in China, you can, on the front you see it's actually the cemeteries of people who, again, sort of abandoned and forgotten. Uh, in the back, you can see the oil refinery uh, in, the, in, in, in the backdrop. So I'm kind of, you know, um, I'm not going to explain, but I think it's kind of self-evident, but you can go on and talk about some of those. Um, and then finally, I want to end this with this image. I have a video very quickly, but um, end with these images because uh, I think he asked me to talk about it. I think this is sort of images. This, so this photo um, was taken in the studio, but um, the negative was a found negative in uh, one of the, uh, during one of the field trip to Kazakhstan, uh, uh, in which by chance that we found that there were a negative in one of the long range strategic bomber base. So this is the base where they, launch, they would launch the strategic bombers uh, if there's a nuclear war. So the, the, the you know, and the, the military base was com decommissioned since the 90s. And so over the next two few decades, this, uh, the building is sort of decayed and then the archive, everything was in decay. And then some of this archival footage was resting on the ground in the middle of the desert and we just pick it up and wash them and this photos, a series of photos called Lost Emotion uh, uh, was, you know, to document the, 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 emo the, you know, the lost emotion of this uh, 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 analog film. So this part of what I'm interested in was, in fact, that to think about um, um, the kind of the vast infrastructure that, that would involve in the making of those uh, uh, for Cold War mobilization as well for as for for the, the um, uh, um, for the Cold mobilization, but also links to the uh, what we have now the digital surveillance process. So just so think about from analog to digital, but we can uh, digital technology is now fully um, weaponized, right? So in a way, that's going to think about the continuation of the process despite the change of technology. So now I will end here and then I went with, with the video. The video is nine minutes long, but I'm not going to show the whole full nine minutes. I'm going to um, try to f uh, within five minutes. So, so I don't did this one and I will just, yeah. So I will start. Thank you. So this is a sinkhole. I kind of jokingly call it the single sinkhole of history. Um, but the piece is actually called Burning Desire. Um, this is a sinkhole as a consequence of the Soviets' extraction of natural gas um, at least 50 years ago in Turkmenistan. So the equipment failed and the f everything collapsed into this hole and it's been burning at least for five decades and potentially longer. No one will hear about the actual stories. I talk to some of the local people. Some of them thought that maybe it started even 70 years ago.
piece. There she is. <laughs> Sorry, because of the lighting, so some of the things is not very sharp. So Turkmenistan today is supplied natural gas to China and to Europe. And so I use this sort of thinking about uh, landscape or Cold War is not simply as evidence, but rather I try to think about them you know, um, as metaphor and allegories. So in this case, um, fire pitch, right? If we all, you know, once upon a time, even as kids, maybe in high school, you want to, you know, or even now that you go to a um, um, start of, a bonfire, we surround it with a fire, right? And there's a, some kind of call up, some kind of primordial desire that the sense of fire that often invokes sense of security, community, um, and safety, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? But in this case, the so-called natural wonder that people go and you know, just like the birds, right? We, they kind of like to charge toward it. But at the same time, this is also an a, a industrial disaster that we created. So in a way, that this is also you know, allow me to think about the question of the paradox of civilization, of human civilization, that especially in this age of uh, anthropocene. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for those fabulous presentations that I think introduce um, really a whole set of key questions, insights about how photography has mediated the Cold War um, and how it continues to mediate the Cold War. 
um, I saw there were beautiful echoes between your, both your practices in terms of the idea of um, legacy and aftermath, your revisiting of your photographs made in a moment which we recognize as the sort of, you know, um, fast violence of the Cold War and then Tong's efforts to go and find these remnants and capture them photographically that um, show us that legacy has not left us and is still part of the aftermath we live with. Um, at this point, I would like to turn um, over to the audience for some questions. Uh, we have a, like just over 10 minutes. So um, we only have one mic. So I think the suggestion was that you might say your question, and then I will repeat it to make sure it can be broadcast on Zoom. Um, does that sound okay? Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. I mean, I can bring the mic to you if you'd like it. I can do the talk show routine, right? I just want to say thank you. Um, it's a two-part comment. So first, about you know Andrea's homage at the beginning. I think it's very special that Susan is here as well because I didn't know that it, you know the connection was not from a long time ago, and I've known Susan for the work in Chile, and then Andrea connected me with you also. It's it's really wonderful that always reminding Andrea and you know how expansive that that friendship is. And in terms of the the project of the book and your presentations to connect that. Um, I think that is what is wonderful about this book is it's how also you know like it opens up as, as you were saying at the beginning T, uh, but now with 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 Tung and and Susan uh, presentations as well I think that <clears throat> we also kind of expand again you know the the conception of the Cold War to think to in and the legacies you know to think of in terms of also the relationship with with uh, climate change for instance right like we 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 don't think normally about Cold War. I mean, we do think about that, but it's, it's so present in, in your work as well, you know, uh, and in connection to migration as well, because all of these new waves of migration have to do with, with this legacy, of course, of 50 years, but also, you know, with the, with the, with the effects in, the, in, in climate, you know, like, the, so, I mean, I was just thinking about that. I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but if you want to respond. <laughs> You know, I mentioned was one of the co-founders. Here we go. Um, was one was one of the co-founders, and sh she made the comment to me that if there was an artist call of the present, it would be around climate change instead instead of U.S. intervention. And in, yeah, mm -hmm. it's center. Yeah. I mean, it was not directly a theme within the book, but um, in some of the other work that I was doing when I was going through kind of the archives of the Vietnam News Agency, for example, there was a real um, interest in the landscape of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But then in the Mekong Delta, with, with all of the, um, uh, the, the bombings that were, the spraying that was um, uh, denuding the forests and so on, there was a real... Um, consideration of of how the land was being stripped bare, and I, I remember viewing this material and reflecting upon kind of um, kind of how it was registering in the moment and how important it is to um, I think that it, that this material really needs um, it, it's reckoning with in this moment, but it certainly was being seen um, and reflected on in uh, the documentation at the time. If I can step out of my moderator role into my author role for the Cold War camera, I would say that that's, it's really interesting to think about that in the context of the case study that I wrote about, which was um, the Canadian government's decision to relocate um, Inuit families to the far, far north, where it was totally not possible to survive um, and it caused great devastation to those families and to the communities um, because they really wanted to insist with the collaboration of the US government on ownership of the Arctic against Russian uh, incursions. And it turns out that that whole 
activity realm in the 50s was a rehearsal because, of course, now climate change has radically changed the Arctic, and now Russian ships, warships, and can get through much farther than they used to. And so that has completely reopened. And, you know, um, so, and of course, it's also um, made it possible to drill for oil in places that could not, you know, so there are huge political and economic um, possibilities that have opened up, but of course, the uh, the Russian government is is building on all sorts of Soviet activities in order to make that happen. Other questions, comments are welcome to. <laughs> That's the joy of a you know small conference where. And wait. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. It was really, really fascinating to listen to all your presentations. Um, my name is Dida. I'm doing PhD here, and I'm uh, so my project is sort of within the context of the global Cold War. And I was really fascinated that now we talk about we don't talk about U.S. and the Soviet Union, but we talk about the the global Cold War. But you know, ever since the war in Ukraine, like very, very conservative, very, very stupid. Cold War takes started appearing again. They were all about, you know, whatever U.S. wants, whatever the Soviet, like whatever Russia wants. And coming originally from Central Asia, it's always, you know, you are kind of like pushed to choose alliances in some way or another, even though the Central Asian governments already made their alignments as well. So anyways, what I'm trying to ask is, what are the potential pitfalls you are seeing in the expansion of the notion of Cold War? Because I also... I think it's so difficult to live nowadays and be in some kind of, I mean, we are all affected by what's happening by the global Cold War and what is happening nowadays. But what are, like, I mean, obviously we can get a lot of this, uh, a lot from expanding the notion, but what are the, the, the challenges that you see with doing this? Thank you so much. That is an amazing question. I wish I had an answer. Um, uh, in my various projects, I get versions of that question, whether it be a different genre, what is you know, opening it up. Um, so number one, one of the, the challenges might be kind of the pitfalls of analogy, right? So um, is it sloppy kind of um, histories when you, you just think, okay, well, this is back, going back to Vietnam. This is another Vietnam. Or um, this is, um, so I don't mean to suggest in kind of expanding or trying to think through kind of a, a global lens through the Cold War. I mean, this is not anything new. This is how the, global, how the Cold War played out. It played out mm. globally. Mm -hmm. And so for us to try to develop a critical lens for understanding the significance of that that, that is the intervention. It's not simply to say, okay, well, let's look at this case study that isn't really the Cold War and, and try to bring it into th that dimension, right? It is really about kind of, let us look at what actually really happened here that people disregarded because they were too busy paying attention to the superpowers. Mm -hmm. As though, the, uh, as though um, ordinary people who were affected through um, slow and fast violence didn't matter um, and that didn't somehow feel the, the, the tangible effects of that history raining down on them. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so this was, I guess, if, if there's a stake to this project, that is one of the crucial, critical analytical stakes there are because we didn't, I felt that I, I didn't have the a critical lens with which to really understand it because what had been given to us, whether you work in, I don't know, in my field, photography studies or visual studies, um, they're, they're kind of... Um, uh, intellectual legacies that were being brought to bear that didn't seem to fit those particular contexts because they were oriented towards a, a particular viewing position um, that weren't really attuned to the specificities of the way in which the Cold War was playing out in these particular sites. So to get to your question about, okay, well, you're picking, um, I think it's picking sides, um, uh, trying to kind of, is it the new Cold War? I'm not, I guess... For that, I'm interested in why that discourse is, is being imposed in this particular moment, 
right? So I, for, um, I, and I'm not a Soviet scholar, and, then, and this is again going back to collaboration and why a collaboration is, is important and needed. I don't have that expertise. I'm gonna learn from, from um, collaborators who have that, uh, that expertise. I'm really um, interested in kind of the um, longer, the continuities between in um, kind of imperial desire, uh, imperialist desires that are at play and that straddle these two, uh, these two particular periods. So that's what I'm getting at. The pitfall is um, a dehistoricization of the Cold War. And I would, I would say as someone that um, lives and teaches in South Texas, understanding this history is it's necessary and it hasn't been done um, and it's not understood. Um, because, I mean, as Susan's film that she wasn't able to show, I think, um, suggests, right, the intertwined um, history between U.S. intervention in Central America and what is happening and continues to happen along the border right now. Um, it's a crisis of the border um, that I feel the global Cold War, in fact, like that as an analytic, um, it's you know, the way in which it crosses borders is, is so necessary. Um, but, I, but yeah, and I, I see your point completely. Um, but again, I think, you know, I agree with T that it's, it's about not, repl you know, not saying this is another Cold War, but understanding the legacies, the effects, right? And that they didn't stop. And I know even within art history, my own field of study, you know, there's periodizations, like the contemporary starts like at the end of the Cold War as if the Cold War ends. And, you know, I had a grad student tell me that they had a... Um, a reading question kind of on, again, you know, that very periodization. And it's like we're just replicating that instead of interrogating those um, you know, uh, divisions, right, and, and structures. Um. So in, in closing, could I just ask Susan and Tong, I, I love this idea of the pitfalls or the challenges or the potential um, black hole. Um, so in terms of your photographic work, like where do you see the, the real challenges either in the, f you know, the images or audiences or recontextualization or, and so on? Yeah, just ongoing. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what comes next. You know, I, I mean, the life of a, I mean, the life of an image I really experienced for the first time through the Molotov Men. It was, I didn't even, I didn't, that idea came from seeing, not from thinking, from responding and seeing others respond. And so that's a process that's very dynamic and dialectic and what will come next, I don't know. So there's a part of me that is of age to look back Right versus, but not knowing what's going to move forward. So I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that process. I mean, I don't know how many of you really make photographs versus write about photographs, talk about photographs. They're very different processes. So I don't know if what's most important now for me is to make more photographs about whatever that might be, or to really try and understand what I've made in new contexts and share it both with the audiences from which the work has come. Mm -hmm. It could be those individuals, it could be those societies. Um, so that's, I, I think my natural organic process has been to return and to return and to return. And it's some part of, no, I think very early in my practice was a circle and a connection. So if I make an image of you, is it of you or with you? And right from the beginning, it was bringing it back to you. Not as a, um, you know, as a ploy to say, but just really the, the natural process that felt appropriate. And that, the iterations of that. I mean, you can't imagine how shocking it was to find the Molotov man on the students' chess in the streets fighting Ortega, who was a Sandinista, right, who used that same image 
right, over time. It's just so complex to really understand what, what these... And this you're so... I love this idea of the... What really is metaphoric... I do, I do see evidence as maybe more metaphoric than you do. <laughs> <laughs> For me, you know, I mean, seeing Sandino with that barricade in 2018, mm-hmm. and the whole country was barricaded. You can't imagine how close they were to overcoming the Sandinista president from the street with by identification with this past that was beyond who he was, even though he aligned himself. These are really complex patterns Mm -hmm. to try and, Mm -hmm. you know, they're entangled. Mm -hmm. I think we were talking about this. They're entangled. They're not, I think I've also said they're pickup sticks, you know, like you you don't know how to unpack them. So I think it's a constant process of recovery and reflection and new fresh eyes, which is why we've come to know each other and and why I was so moved by even thinking about some of my, some of you out there, (laughs) because it just goes on. We get, we try to be smarter. Okay, so uh, do do I, I think they need to turn it on. So I I think maybe for me that um, to make images of sort of the sort of interesting secret city, think about things that is not visible, uh, and also think about the aftermath, afterlife. For me, so it's really about um, reframing, recontextualizing the Cold War is really to um, decolonize the US-centric notion of the Cold War or the superpower-centric notion of the Cold War. So, so it's not really pitfall, but so because the idea of this identify certain current moment and say, oh, this is like Cold War number two or just like the Cold War, is to reinforce the original US-centric notion of the Cold War, right? It's not helpful. But at the same time, if we go back to that historical process to actually rethink the origins and the unfolding of it, actually allow us to move away from that narrative. That would allow us to have better understanding of what is going on today uh, in Ukraine, in you know the, the migrants who are still coming in. It's very much a continuation of that process. So I think we need to really de- decolonize the, the notion of the Cold War. Great. Okay. So uh, now we are shifting to the book signing cocktail portion of <laughs> of the event. Um, thank you all. We have a hard finish at by seven at the very very latest so grab a drink and your book <laughs> um, yeah. oh, my hair. Th- thank you so much my hope is that we don't stop talking and that we will continue to um, have reflections and discussion in a more informal setting over wine thank you Cheers.